Yeah. So how on earth did you narrow it down? How did you pick what you wanted to focus on? Because there's a finite amount of space to cram an awful lot of stuff into. You mean the 60,000 stories of Burning Man? And how do you, fit, how, how do you find the right stories for 90 minutes? Um, so what, we were looking for, a, I'd say, a story arc that was very similar across the board, which are people that what they took from Burning Man was um, the catalyst or inspiration to act on a dream and set off on a, on a journey to do some, some big ambitious project that they'd never done before. Um, it's one of the more common experiences of Burning Man and it's actually one of my experiences from Burning Man with this film. This is the first time I've ever um, produced a feature film um, and it was very much that similar kind of a, of a journey that Burning Man is a community that is sort of designed intentionally to give people the freedom and the permission to act on their dreams. Um, and uh, so a lot of stories like that start at Burning Man. So I was looking for, and our team was looking for stories that um, where, where, where we could follow somebody who was acting on a dream. Somebody like Katie, who didn't used to be an artist, but she went to Burning Man and decided that that was what she was going to be. And we filmed her from, her very, from conception to realization of her first art project. Otto von Danger, very different side of uh, Burning Man and kind of unexpected for people who think it's just a rave. Uh, or it's some sort of hippie thing. Um, uh, but for, for him, this was the first time he did a big, meaningful project. They were just really trying to make a statement and make a difference in the world. And what he was actually trying to do is trying to, to create a statement that was really uniting the frustrations of the, both the Tea Party and the Occupy movement. And so it was a big, ambitious uh, project. And, and John LaGrace, um, he was, not only was he kind of on the front line of this growth of Burning Man becoming worldly and, um, and people with a lot of money showing up and, and kind of paying for a catered experience at Burning Man, which was very controversial. Um, he was from one of those camps, a producer of one of those camps, but this was the year when he was um, really, when, he, when the whole camp was really trying to give back and really was trying to do something new, which was host a, a Playa School and which was the, 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 the set for uh, TEDx Black Rock City, which is how I of got connected to them in the first place because I was organizer, a co-organizer of that. So we were looking for stories that were somebody acting on a dream, what happens next, um, and kind of a cross-section of different aspects of Burning Man, theme camps and um, kind of the roughneck side of Burning Man and art side of Burning Man. Um, and then we got invited in to um, film more and more of the founders and inside the organization and we realized their story was the same thing. They had big dreams, and those dreams were also getting very complicated as they kind of collided with reality in the year that Burning Man hit, hit limits for the first time. How did you ensure the consent of everyone being filmed, um, especially for like people kind of the rabbit popping out or people uh, riding on the ramp? So anyone we were interviewing, we, we, got to, we, asked, if, we asked for permission. Um, General crowd scenes in public places, um, you know, that's a, that's a little more complicated, but um, you know, a crowd scene in a public place where lots of people are being filmed, um, you know, it's, that's kind of fair game. But anybody we interviewed or really kind of went in close and told their story, though we, all, we, we asked for consent. Hi, thanks for making the film. Um, what didn't make it into the film? What, what is that? What didn't make it into the film? What scene? Oh, what, what so aspects? much. <laughs> Actually, one of my, my background is in tech and software, and uh, some of the, from my standpoint, some of the most fascinating stories of Burning Man are, are uh, you know, the, the, the creativity and the innovation that happens when it's not about pleasing your venture capitalists or about your money or you know the sort of the Silicon Valley, but it's purely it's just pure play and innovation in this harsh environment, um, and you see that in art, um, but you also see that in technology. And um, uh, I mean, there was a project just this last year where um, people from ID8 were, go, you take off your clothes, go into a full body scanner, and then they would make a 3D model of you, and then they would uh, uh, attach a little tracking device to you, and then their, their radio controlled octocopter would come and drop the model, you drop your clone off you know, somewhere in the playa. You know, that, that's actually pretty, was sort of cool and fun and interesting and playful and, and 
Um, but we, weren't, we just weren't there filming that one. But some that we did film were more tech, tech stories. Um, a couple years ago, you'd go to Burning Man, and you'd turn on your iPhone, and you'd say, gosh, I didn't know AT&T worked out here. And well, it doesn't. It was just some guys from the OpenBTS project who were uh, the open source uh, uh, mobile phone kind of operating system. And, um, and they had a solar powered uh, antenna, and they were um, uh, playing a cell phone company out there, beta testing, um, really cool technology about how do we create um, mobile technology for people who live on a dollar a day. Um, you know, for the, for, the, for, for the liberation technologies for um, uh, poor countries. And their beta site is Burning Man. And where, where their next customers are, you know, in Somalia or who knows where they are. Um, so there were, there were things like that that were um, really interesting and they were the sound of the same kind of story. People inspired to do something creative and original and ambitious in this environment and not doing it for money, and not doing it for status, and not doing it for fame, but purely doing it as a creative collaboration. And there's a lot of stuff like that. Not all of it is simple enough and visual enough to work in a film like this. I mean, back to the last question, there's 60,000 stories out there. You need, to, you need to find stories that are fairly simple and fairly visual and can line up. Obviously, you went through and, and sort of talked to talked a lot about um, you know, people's stories, the, the, the struggles that they had to get there. I'm interested to know what your struggle was in making the film. Like, what were your kind of highs and lows? So making a film, I discovered, is a lot like, uh, well, it's just another startup, which means you need to have some crazy idea. You need to convince some really great people to join you and collaborate with you. You need to raise the money. You need to execute like crazy. Um, and then at some point you've got to get distribution. Um, and, and it was kind of the, the, the same thing. And every one of those steps is loaded with challenges uh, just like it is with a startup. I think that the, the biggest challenge in making a film like this, which is a story of real people and real lives, no actors, no script, um, but a working hypothesis for where the story is going and what's going to happen next, the biggest challenge is actually being there when the story is unfolding. Um, and there were stories that we were following that kind of went in a different direction or just kind of didn't, didn't really go where we thought it was going to go. And, um, and the other ones really kind of grew. But if, you, if you're not there with the camera rolling, it's like it didn't happen. So the biggest challenge is actually being there when things are happening. And if you saw so many things in here, you saw that we, we were actually there in a lot of really unique moments in the story. Both of those artists who were trying to, to manifest their dream and do some big project, but also of the Burning Man organization and the founders. So all these moments when, when um, their kind of dreams were colliding with reality and getting very complicated, we were in there in those meetings. I mean, actually, I wasn't in those meetings, and my co-director, Jesse Dieter, wasn't in those meetings, but our camera and sound people are in the meetings. And they were like, you can't, you can't come to this meeting. This is a private meeting, but we're going to let your cameras be in here. It was, it was a really strange thing. So, so we, we, were, we were there um, at these moments when they were arguing kind of fundamental questions of their principles, as they're kind of, they had this sort of collision of principles between this openness that allowed people to truly be free versus now what do they do when it's sold out and too many people want to go. And they were, it was really, a, 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 and everybody kind of out in the world thought, well, they didn't know what was going on. But when you saw the footage inside the boardroom, you see they're having really heartfelt debates about principles and values. And that was a big surprise. And, and, um, and it was really amazing to, to witness that. But that was very lucky that we, we were there with the cameras rolling when all that was going down. What was the funding? Uh, how did you raise the funding, and who provided the funding, and what was the budget for this movie? Well, you saw the whole last part of the uh, the credits, and there are actually some people from the early days of Google on that list. Um, I uh, uh, I did most of the fundraising, and I asked a lot of people, told people about the project, and I explained the, the vision of what we were trying to do and the story and why I thought it was a, a story that was much more relevant than just a Burning Man story. It was a, a very universal story. Um, and uh, and uh, some people backed it. And uh, as far as I'm not going to, for the talk, I'm not going to put a number on, on the actual budget. But if you look at, we were 13 months in production of filming. 
Um, and all those shoots had a director of photography, had a sound engineer, um, had a producer, associate producer uh, there helping organize it all. And you have hundreds of hours of footage, um, and then hundreds more hours of archival footage from the old days. And then uh, and there's a lot of time spent with our amazing editor, Andy Gersh, uh, editing that down to the 90 minutes that you saw. And then there's uh, an amazing soundtrack for, for the movie. And even though most of the artists in the, on the soundtrack um, have been inspired by Burning Man or have some connection to Burning Man and did some amazing original music for the film, they also have labels and managers and agents. So all that costs a lot of money. So it was a pretty big, ambitious um, project for uh, a documentary. Uh, what were you doing just before you started this, and how did you decide to, you know, how did you decide to actually get started on this project if, if it was so big? So I'd been um, involved in a number of startups, usually software, and um, and I'd been in uh, kind of every time it's been kind of the similar drill of you have a, a, a vision which is to do to solve some problem that's going to change the world, and you raise money and you start to. to to um, execute on that vision, and you need to get more and more and more focused um, on a very specific thing to make that, that work. And I found it kind of starting to be more constraining, and I was looking for a creative canvas that was more open. And um, uh, film uh, is a very wide open and very human creative canvas. And, and that, so I was really interested in getting involved um, with that. And so when uh, and we sort of stumbled across a story that looked really relevant and interesting. Um, I think sort of kind of unfolded. You, you go to Burning Man and you say, gosh, you know, I've always wanted to make a film. And all of a sudden, you're surrounded by people that say, how can I help? <laughs> um, and so stuff starts to become real. I'm wondering, how did you recruit uh, people to be the subjects of your film? So we. Um, you sort of start with what you know, but you also are seeking out. We were also seeking out a, a kind of a, a kind of a story which resembled really kind of our own story with the project. People that were acting on a dream, trying to to, to setting off on a on a some big project. And we also had to go with where we had where people were accessible. There were probably some amazing projects where people in Europe were building something uh, to bring to Burning Man, and it was the same story. But we weren't over there. We were here. So um, our subjects were a little closer to home. The ones that we were able to film all the way through were a little closer to home. Um, but uh, we discovered Katie. Um, I had, we were filming a number of people. And I actually, I remember I showed, um, I showed some of our footage, some selects of some of the people we were um, starting to, to develop character sketches of. I showed it to my, my daughter, and she said, um, Dad, this is a very important story about creativity and um, um, being free and being, uh, being able to be creative and following your passion. That's a very important story for young people, too. So it shouldn't just be a bunch of old people having a midlife crisis. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized, I went back and I looked at the people, and I realized, you know, it, we, we need to we need to keep looking, <laughs> is what, um, and uh, and so we were looking, and then I'll, and then we went to film um, Marco Cochran, who's an artist, amazing artist, who does these huge sculptures at Burning Man, Bliss Dance, and uh, Truth is Beauty, um, and uh, and he's he's been doing that for for twenty years, and so that's really interesting. But there wasn't a story unfolding because it was it was similar to what he's been doing for a long time. But right behind him, working welding on on one of the sculptures was Katie. And so we went there interviewing Marco to talk to Marco. And then we said, well, who's that? <laughs> who's that on your team? And it turned out she was right at the beginning of that story. So we were looking for that kind of story. And, um, and I wanted, we wanted to find a story where it was connected to the great art of Burning Man. Um, and, uh, and, and she was there. Otto von Danger, this one's my son's fault. Um, so he said, Dad, this is not going to be a good movie unless there's somebody that's a little bit crazy. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so we, we, we actually went to, um, up to the playa on July 4th, uh, 2012. And we actually thought we might be shooting the end of the movie, because we thought Burning Man might not happen, or it might never be the same. It might not come back together, because a lot of the big projects were not able to 
to they didn't, their, their crew couldn't get tickets. So they, and because and everyone was mad at Burning Man, and so no one could raise money, and so everything sort of felt like it was falling apart. So we went up there for July 4th, where it's kind of like the old days. No organization, no fence, no tickets. And um, uh, that's where I met Otto von Danger, and he had some crazy project he was doing out there where they were exploding things and blowing things up and shooting lots of guns. And, um, and I asked my son, who was with me, and he says, well, how about Otto? And he said, I think he'll do. Um, and and he, it was a wonderful story, and he's a wonderful uh, uh, character, and he really embodied this, um, a number of things, but just this, this passion and commitment to, and, and this canvas that, of Burning Man that allows people to do kind of huge ambitious things that, that you wouldn't expect them to be able to do. Otto von Danger is living on disability. Um, he's an dis, uh, injured um, Marine, and he's, you know, he's, he's having a hard time getting by. And then at Burning Man, he's working on a massive, super challenging, super roller coaster, but big ambitious project. And, and to me, that, um, that kind of story where, I mean, Katie was a nanny, and Otto is a, a, a disabled veteran, and John LeGrace, somebody who lost everything. Um, they're sort of people who are they're not like the, the Google founders. They're not like the famous people who are out at Burning Man. They're very ordinary people with actually with a lot stacked against them. But you kind of flip the values. And in this environment, they shine and they rise, and they're the heroes. And I thought those, those were the kind of people that, one, we were looking for, but uh, two, they were also more accessible. Um, they were um, open to us following them around for a year. Thanks. I was sort of struck by the fact that everybody went through this intense process of, you know, very systematically building and working and sort of a structured, even though it was a little crazy process. And then they got to have their moment of release at Burning Man, where their project all came to an end and they saw the results. You were still in the middle of your process at that point. Can you talk <laughs> about that a little bit and how your experience was? Yeah, we're, we're still in the middle of the process because we're just now launching the film in theaters and on demand just this weekend. So, um, yeah, it is a bit, kind of like the people in the film. It is sort of a never-ending process. The interesting thing is so there's sort of two kinds of projects that were in the film. They're the ones that burned down. And that creates a space to do something totally new. Um, and then there are other ones where, like Katie's heart, you know, it's, she's not, she didn't burn that down. Comes back down the hill. It's in a warehouse. She's trying to figure out what to do with it. Should I do another Kickstarter to add some more bells and whistles to it and bring it back to Burning Man, or you know, what, what should I do with this thing? And and I think that that one of the things that's unique about Burning Man as an entire city, but also a lot of the art projects, is that kind of creative destruction goes back to the dust so people can start over. And this film is almost to the point where it's, it really is launched. And then it's wide open space. And then, then, I, then everybody in film is like this. And you can kind of take a breath and say, what's next? It's what's unique about film is that you have this intense effort on a project, and it has an end. Um, and you know, a, a company and, um, goes on. Well, maybe it has an end when Google buys it, <laughs> um, but it, maybe it goes on it, it, indefinitely. But but films, um, you know, like a lot of these art projects, they have an end, and then that creates a space for something new. That's what I like about about film. I, I thought there was an interesting kind of a conflict of ideas between Larry Harvey and John Law, and the presentation of uh, Law towards the end of the movie uh, where he. You're showing his image and talking about the org turning into a nonprofit, and I kind of wonder if he gave you any kind of a take on what he thinks about that, or you know how that how that affects him. I did sit with John Law and uh, sit ne sat next to John Law and watch the film with him um, when we played in uh, Sacramento, and uh, I said, John, I'm going to sit next to you in case you need to kick me, because <laughs> um, I, I didn't know. Um, at the time, I didn't know before he saw the film what, what he'd think of it. But, but really what, I mean, he, he was a really interesting, important character in the film because there you saw this original rift, um, this original collision of values. I mean, the original dream was one about this sort of pure freedom. Um, and then at some point, it got out of control. People actually got killed up there in 1996. And it really was out of control. So they had to decide 
know, this sort of almost this utopian anarchist ideal of freedom wasn't going to work anymore. So what are they going to do? Is it going to just go away? Um, or are they going to reinvent it? And uh, John Law didn't want the reinvention that was form an LLC, form a company, sell tickets, put up a fence, create a container for it, buy insurance. He didn't want to be part of that. He wanted to stick to the original dream and the original uh, value. So there's a big parting of ways. Um, and then uh, uh, when we were filming this in uh, 2011, 2012, we were sort of hitting the next big inflection point where, again, it was a collision of values. I mean, that was what, what, the core of what was happening. They have values that were really interesting and in that they, they'd sort of gone from pure self-expression and freedom to a combination of self, values of self-expression and values of community. And can we create a community that allows people to truly be themselves? Um, and uh, that idea was working amazingly for many, many years until they hit limits, until there wasn't enough to go around. And then the question is, who gets to decide who gets to be part of this? If somebody stands there as the judge and decides who's worthy of being part of it, then the whole idea that you truly have that freedom kind of gets eroded because now I'm trying to prove myself. I'm trying to prove I'm good enough. Um, or at least I have that feeling, or there's even a hint of that feeling. Um, and so that's why they did the lottery, because they didn't want to be the judge. And then, you know, then that was a catastrophe because it destroyed community. So I've seen it all, all along. It's been this really interesting debate of values. It was sort of like the Western culture requirement at freshman year at Stanford, where philosophers from kind of thousands of years ago all the way through the present are sort of having these fundamental arguments about freedom versus order and how do we create a society that allows people to be free, but you know you need some structure, you need some governance, otherwise freedom goes away. These, these kind of debates were all playing out real time. So the John Law rift was a very early one about order um, versus freedom. And then they reinvented themselves, and then they had this new collision. But the resolution of the new collision of values seemed to be, when we were filming it, that maybe there'd be a new transformation. And what really ticked off John Law was sort of the becoming this or company. Maybe that was going to go away. Maybe there was going to be some new form, and maybe that rift would possibly even heal. There was sort of hope. I, like, I heard that a number of times, and people we talked to, there was a hope that 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 rift might somehow heal um, in the whatever came next. And um, we don't know whether or not that's going to happen or where that, that's going to end. But um, we have seen that this idea of a community of people that really allow each other to be themselves and, and, and in the context of collaborating on art, that that's happening a lot of places, not just at Burning Man. We showed this in Washington, DC. And I had people in the audience say, I've been to three burns, but I've never been to the playa. So I mean, it's sort of happening. I mean, here's on the East Coast. Who would have thought um, that that'd be happening in Washington D.C.? But it's um, and then you saw at the end, you know, where it's happening around around the world. Um, so there's there's an idea that that maybe maybe some of those original values that John Law was kind of involved with, maybe those are coming back in sort of the new form of Burning Man, which is not sort of contained to the to the playa. So that's at the end we're sort of kind of raising that question, but the verdict's not in yet. It's still, that, that story's just beginning. Thank you so much for coming. This was excellent. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.